Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I am joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. Behind the scenes, how are you, Brent? I'm well, thank you. For today's podcast, we're going to go over my archery setup, from arrows and broadheads to the actual bow to the release, the releases. Uh, I am using how I like to use them, why I use them. Uh, we talk about the sight, the rest, mm-hmm. the quiver. I don't you know have, if we got into the quiver much, but it's a tight spot. There mm-hmm. you go, folks. It's a tight spot quiver, seven arrows. I did talk about that. Mm-hmm. I like the tight spot because it gets so close mm-hmm. to the bow, and I, I like the balance I achieve there. Anyway, if you are listening to this podcast, you might want to go to the YouTube channel and actually watch it because there's quite a bit of visuals involved as we go over what the bow setup is. It's an RX-4. Uh, it's a Hoyt RX-4 Ultra. and I'm shooting 80 pounds, and it's uh, a 28-inch draw. My arrows are 474 grains, a heavy extreme front of center design with the Valkyrie system. You got and what, 22, 23% front of center? It's up there, mm-hmm. beyond 20% for sure. And then the, uh, or 21, 22, the arrows are flying at 280 feet per second out of that setup. And, uh, it's a good speed for me. It's, it's, I mean, anywhere between 280 to 285 to 90 is kind of a, a nice spot. Broadheads and the field tips are all hitting to the same spot and I'm able to go back and forth between releases. I'm using a, a knock to it from John and I'm using a, uh, I've got the, for years I've been using that, uh, true ball HT. The, I think it's the medium size. The jawbreaker, that thing scares me every time I look at it. <laughs> I love that release. I actually use John's hinge release because it really does line up well with the knock to it. But I, I still go back to the HT. I really like that. Um, prefer that one. So we covered that. We went over it this morning. Um, I even dropped a little bit about the Garmin Zero at the end of the podcast comparing the, cause I've got a, a, I've got my old RX three with the Garmin zero on it, which I killed some animals with last year. And then I've got my RX four and the ultra. And you can see the two kind of, mm-hmm. they're very different bows. You're talking about a short axle to axle bow versus a really tall, but man, I shot the other bow really well too. The RX three really well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the three, the RX three, the RX four are both killer bows. Anyway, we're going to jump into that. So check out the podcast uh, coming up. Before we do, I just want to remind you, it is close to archery season. You can use the code GRITTY at Valkyrie Archery if you're looking for some broadheads uh, for your setup. Brent does offer the Blood Eagle broadheads that are that don't require the center pin system, uh, that are just some nice broadheads that will screw into basically any standard arrow. So he's got those at Valkyrie as well as, you know, the, the more advanced setup that I have, which is the center pin design. Uh, also use the code gritty at mountain ops and at sissy sticks. Those are two major partners of ours. Uh, every time you purchase from those, from those guys, you get a pair of trekking poles, get yourself some, uh, ignite. That is really helpful to us. Also use the code gritty for a pack of rafts. If you're looking for a backcountry raft, check those guys out. We've been pushing those guys for a while because it's such a nice piece of gear and it really does uh, change the game out there. Also use the code gritty for sheep feet, custom orthotic insoles. I've been running those a lot. And here's a little tidbit. I have been testing thoroughly my new brick stall, crispy brick stalls against my crispy Nevada uninsulated, trying to see how they handle in the deep August heat, hiking these mountains behind the hill, uh, five miles straight up wearing the uh, sheep feet in both boots um, and uh, just seeing how each one performs. I keep falling back on the crispy Nevada every time. Um, I like the brick stall. I like it a lot. I think my foot's just a little wide though. If you've seen my feet on the sheep feet imprints, because you do the custom orthotic mm-hmm. and you stamp your foot into the custom imprint. That's on your Instagram page. Dude, somewhere. I have a hobbit foot. Like I, I have a... It is wide. Mm-hmm. I have a big old fat square foot. You mean dad, all three of us have really wide feet. Yeah. It's hard. My my pinky toe always breaks through my tennis shoes. 
my yeah. running shoes, they always break through within three or four months, my pinky toe. Button. Yeah, I, I feel like I'd like the brick stall if my foot was a little more narrow. I still like it. Don't get me wrong. I really like the boot. But if I had to choose between the two, I feel more stable and more comfortable in the Nevada. But I've been putting a lot of miles on both boots, mm-hmm. you know, at times one on each foot. I look like a clown up there. But I have more stability uh, in the the Nevada it feels more comfortable for long, long miles, but that brick stall is really nice. I will say it it's gripping the mountain good. I don't slip quite as much in the brick stall as I do in the Nevada. It's got a stiffer boot. It's got a nicer edge when you're side hilling. If it, and if you are, if you have more of a foot that that likes that stiffness, you'd prefer, I think, the brick stall. Uh, but I wanted to uh, test it. It's one of those boots I haven't put a lot of time in on. And uh, so far, it's a close second for me. So for a lot of guys, it's much better. Something that keeps coming up over and over again about the Nevada, I have guys that will say the Nevada, you know, the first three or four miles feels good. And then my feet start, my toes start to hit the front of the boot or it hurts. Look, all I know is I buy a half size bigger in the full grain leather. Uh, I even buy a half size bigger in Brickstall. They fit true to form when I have like a sock liner and just my plain old like mid-weight wool sock. But my feet, you know, after four or five miles and the heat like we have right now, your feet swell. And there's a thing called the hiking induced edema. That, that happens for God, some people more than others, where your hands and your feet both swell quite a bit just from miles hiked. Um, and for most people, their feet are going to get hot. They're going to swell a little bit. Yeah. And when that happens, the boot's going to be too small. So I just recommend guys go out and buy that boot a little bit bigger, half size bigger than your normal size. And eventually, too, just because it's leather, full grain, supple leather, a little bit of moisture, mm-hmm. you know, as long as you keep it oiled and everything's great, it's fine. But all it takes is Adam Green Tree to crank up the stove <laughs> once with your boots soaking wet next to it, and they are toast. Toast. They're too tight. And so I just know inevitably I'm going to, because of the rugged mm-hmm. miles I put on my boots, and I want them to go for 2,000 to 2,500 miles of use on them. Knowing that, I feel like I've got the most out of the boots over the years by buying that half size bigger. So in the beginning, they're a little bit, they're a little oversized, but within 500, three, 200 to 500 miles, they're, they're snug as a bug in a rug. They're perfect. I got just the right amount of space in there for my feet to get good blood flow, to account for swelling, um, not too big, not too small. But if I go with my normal size, which is 10 and a half, they'll be too tight within a few months or all, not, not necessarily in a few months, but, but just the moment they, they are soaking wet and they dry too quickly. That's just the nature of leather. And, and even though I've conditioned it and I take really good care of the letter leather, it shrinks a little bit. And then what happens is that toe box on the front of that crispy kind of pulls up a little bit mm-hmm. because the leather on the top shrinks in. And as it curves up, boom, your toes are in the front of the boot. So a lot of guys will complain about it. So I just, that's my recommendation. Uh, I think if you call crispy, they're going to be like, no, don't buy the, uh, don't buy the oversized, just buy your right size. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm here to tell you, I disagree. Those, I put um, more miles on them than I think a lot of people have. And that's just my experience. What are those things you put inside your shoe? The sheep feet? No, no. It's, um, it's to help keep the shape. Is it called a shoe tree? A shoe horn? Like a shoe. Um, it's not a shoe horn. I know what you mean. I have those by the way. Mm-hmm. You can stick them in there and they uh, they press in and kind of keep your boot a certain shape. I got a good list. It's going to bother me. Yeah. I think that's probably a good way to store them if you're really going to store them. I don't do it very often. Yeah. I have a set. Shoe trees. They are shoe trees. Uh-huh. Okay. And they have a little screw. Mine have mm-hmm. a little screw so they stretch out the boot or keep it's that leather. It's basically a from- piece of wood that's shaped like your foot. And then it's got a screw that you can crank on and it widens it and widens it and widens yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. No, I think it's great if you have a last. A last is what they build a boot around. Mm-hmm. It's a mold, basically, sort of, of your foot. If you've got a last that you can stick in your boot 
when you're not wearing it, I think it's great. So if, if you have access to anyone who builds shoes for a living, right. you're in luck. <laughs> but a shoe, a shoe tree kind of does the same yeah. thing. Anyway, that's a big tangent, but, um, question like that came boots? up the other day. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're going to get into this, but like I said, check out the affiliate codes below on, on our YouTube videos in the description fields. You can find all the yep. different partners we've got. And there's also one more loophole till the end of the month has a deal that's going right. on right now. That's right. Leupold, if you buy a BX5 model binocular or optic, I believe, I think it's a binocular, you'll you just go on their site and look it up, but you will get their carbon fiber tripod for free. And I've talked about that before. It's an excellent tripod. It's worth every penny. They're about, I think they're retailing right now for $350. It is a steal. I have a tripod that's like four ounces, a little bit lighter, barely. And that setup cost me over a thousand. So for the money, it's hard to beat. For the quality, it's hard to beat. It's a great tripod. Not as compact as some, but super light, great tripod. So we're going to get into the podcast. As always, leave the comments below, like the video. We appreciate that. Or hit us up on Instagram, DM us. We'll try to get back to your questions. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call. And today I'm going to go over my archery setup. I got Brent here behind the camera and I'm just going to walk through my bow, basically how the rig is uh, dialed right now. So I've got a Hoyt RX4. Uh, it's a 28 inch draw. This is an 80 pound. They got 80, I got 80 pound limbs on here. It's the ultra and uh, I debated between this and the turbo, decided to go with with this bow because I'm not a big fan of speed cams and stuff. I really like stability in a, in a bow that's extremely forgiving. So I went ahead and went with the Ultra. It's a little bit longer, well, quite a bit longer axle to axle. You know, if I compare it to last year's rig, which which I killed a, my bull elk with this and a coos deer with this setup. Uh, last year, which is the RX3, and <clears throat> you can see my Hoyt RX3 in comparison, smaller, right? I mean, it's just a much smaller, uh, yeah, it is. Jeez, length to length, you know, it's just a smaller bow. Now, it's smooth and I shoot it really well, but I prefer the string angle on a longer, taller bow. When I draw the longer bows, that string is right in the corner of my mouth and right on the tip of my nose where I like to put it. I feel like I get into the peep a lot better, creates a better, more consistent shot. I also feel like the bow just is more stable, more forgiving. My only concern with going with the Ultra opposed to, let's say, a Turbo or this Alpha is just the uh, speed of the of the uh, bow i want the arrow to go at least a decent speed so it's a little more forgiving when i'm guessing yardages or i'm on the hunt and i and i don't have time to range something 30 40 yards i want things to be pretty forgiving in that range so my goal is about a minimum of 280 feet per second that's what i would like to achieve so sure enough uh, i've got this bow set up it is extremely forgiving much more uh, less less uh, temperamental, although I got to admit, I shot lights out with that RX3 Alpha last year. But this is going 280 feet per second with the 80-pound limbs and a 28-inch draw, and these arrows are 474 grains. It's a pretty heavy arrow. I've got the Black Eagle uh, X-Impact arrows with the Valkyrie Broadheads delivery system. I like this setup because that front of center, the extreme front of center weight I've got on here, it is pretty extreme, and uh, this head just just flies. I'm shooting. You can see I've got some of the foam target on it because I've been shooting it a lot. But this Valkyrie arrow, like I said, this is a 300 spine. Um, I've got a 28 inch draw. I've got a 200 grain uh, non vented Valkyrie tip here, and then as you can see, when I pull the broadhead out. It's got the center pin here, which adds a lot of stiffness and stability uh, on that shot. I've got the micro diameter shaft, arrow shaft, and what that does is, you know, if I do hit something kind of at a glance, this spot right in here on the end of the arrow 
the, the tip of the arrow is reinforced by that long center pin that's built into the broadhead. I've shot this now for three years. I've killed a lot of animals from bear to elk to whitetails to mule deer. Um, it's extremely accurate out to 100 yards as a fixed blade. Uh, deadly sharp. I can shoot it into the target. I pretty much practice with these tips all the time. They're, they're rough on targets, but I don't really care. Cost of a new target each year doesn't bother me. Um, but I like shooting my broadheads opposed to field tips. I've got the field tips. So if I'm on a, at attack event or I'm out at a 3d range, of course you can't be shooting broadheads. So I've got the 200 grain target tips, but I generally like here at the house, um, I'm shooting the broadhead all the time. So I know how each arrow is hitting constantly all the time in all conditions. I prefer just shooting my broadheads most of the time. That's the setup. This being, like I said, 474 grains with that heavy front of center. I think it's like 22% of the weight is up front, something like that. The shaft isn't very heavy. It's light. It's really, the, the front is really doing all the work. Um, and it hits hard. You can see when I shoot here with other guys that don't have this, this front of center, this micro shaft, you know, we're shooting at the target and this goes in four, six inches more, sometimes to the fletchings it buries into these targets. Uh, other dudes don't even come close as far as that penetration goes. And then I've seen it through elk or deer you know, where I've hit them at a quartering away and it's gone all the way through the whole body cavity. So it's a, it's an intense system here, the arrow system combined with this bow. So back to the bow, I've got it set up with this, uh, hot rods, these AAE, I think it's the Western style. They're just the, it's the stabilizer. The, um, I got a back bar here and a front bar, uh, weighted stabilizer. Uh, Hoyt has a uh, setup right here that's um, on the string dampener where it comes off at this this angle. Um, I actually have a B stinger adapter. I have the gripper, but it, it's too wide at the top to connect here. So the B stinger actually fits this a little better. So I've got the B stinger attachment, but the, the hot rods uh, bars. I've had a double set of these for a long time and I've got the quick disconnect on the back here. So if I need to pull this off, to put it in my bow case, comes off real quick, gets out of the way. When I throw this quiver on, which is a seven arrow quiver, because I'm backpacked in usually pretty far. I, I don't really want to bring a ton of arrows. You never know what's going to happen. So I like to bring in the uh, seven arrow quiver here. So I've got this seven arrow quiver. It's a tight spot. It's got the five arrows across the front, two in the back, back in here. And I like how tight it is to the bow. And uh, it's adjusted to kind of help with the balance along with the back bar and the front bar here. And the bow just kind of sits just right in my hand when I've got it. It's just balanced perfectly. So there's no torque when I draw the bow and when I'm shooting. It's really well balanced the way I have it set up. And then uh, I, this year I've got a Hamski arrow launcher. Over here I have this Hoyt uh, QAD, which I put on the RX3 last year. It did, it did me well. I, I did like this. It worked fine. This year though, I went with the Hamski and I think it is just a better, a better launcher, better better setup. It's kind of hard to go wrong with the Hamski. It's really easy to set up. So far, this thing is shooting lights out. I, I really haven't had to do much to it. Um, it just out of the box, it was ready to rock. And then I've got this black gold three pin sight, which I have set up at 30, 40, 50 on the pins. And then anything beyond 50, I'm going to dial with the slider. So that's, that's the, uh, the site I've got on here. And then over here, I've got a True Ball HT release. I think the three medium, I think is what, I, three finger medium, something like that. Uh, I've had this for quite a long time. I like to use a hinge when I'm out here just practicing and shooting. And when I'm hunting, I've got this right here, which is the 
uh, knock on knock to it which has the thumb button right here which I can anchor to pretty much the same spot and shoots the same especially you know 60 70 yards in they're impacting about the same got the uh, Leupold range finder right here where how far are we 55 yards to the elk on the hill um, I kind of just like the little pouch that comes with my Leupold I know they have different manufacturer you know different bino harnesses come with a rangefinder rigs i just put what it comes with right on the strap here been carrying it like that for years i put a little toggle on it like this that's detachable a little tether because um sometimes i just need to set that thing down and let it hang while i go to full draw and kill it sometimes i don't want to mess with slipping it back in the pocket although it's really easy and then um, right here I have the marsupial gear like uh, bino harness. And when I'm on the stock, I like how quiet and easy th this is to slip in. There's no flap in the way. Like the FHF and some other ones, you know, it comes over the top. And then you got to like every time you get the binos out, that thing's in the way. This is just open, quick, easy. You just get it in, get it out. You can do it while you're on the stock pulling pull out your binos take a few peeks as you're getting in tight it's real quiet feels really good the chest harness it all feels nice and compact i'll shoot a couple arrows here we're at 55 yards i really like shooting with a hinge just because of the it just i, I don't know it it sort of um, keeps me honest generally it's a surprise release you know, I'm just holding, 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 holding on target. I mentioned that in our uh, last podcast we did on target panic, uh, targeting buck fever. I really do like shooting the hinge. Uh, and then, you know, I'll switch over to the thumb button as needed. The hinge, you know, I just... As I come to full draw on the hinge, especially if there's no wind, I'm not too nervous. I have to worry about my heart rate being super high. I can get this thing off real smooth. You know, I'm just letting the, fin, the pin float over there. For those who haven't used a hinge, you know, it's, it's just on a, like a half moon system. And what happens is, is I come to full draw like this. And then see how the hinge is forward. And then as it rotates like this, it breaks. When you're at full draw and I've got, I'm doing a little push pull between the pull and the push against the bow. And I'm trying to pull straight and push straight and hold that pin on target. And as I do that and I keep pulling with some tension there, the hinge release starts to rotate and then the shot breaks and the arrow just goes. And there's a there's a, a major reduction in anxiety. As I just let the arrow do its thing. However, I've mentioned this before, when the heart rate gets up really high and I'm breathing super hard, you know, let's say I drop down and I do 50 burp or 15 burpees. There's a big difference trying to shoot after you know, you're breathing that hard. Sometimes what I like to do, I mean, it's an interesting exercise if you haven't done it. Um, I don't know about you, but my heart uh, pounds out of my chest when um, an elk or a big buck is coming, that white tail, mule deer, black bear, whatever it is, mountain goat. Man, when that moment comes up, especially when it's a real unicorn, you know, um, that heart rate is through the roof and it doesn't really drop for me unless, unless I can sit here and calm down and watch it. Or if I'm on the stock, my heart rate seems to stay lower than if I'm in ambush. I don't know why, but over the years I've kind of figured out myself. So dealing with that heavy, like trying to execute a shot while your heat chest is heaving and the adrenaline is making your hands lose fine motor skills um i found like in the past years ago i was like you know what i'm just going to try to control my adrenaline 
well, that's important. I want to breathe well and I do want to control it to a degree. But what I found is it only goes away to a certain level. I've learned that I need to be able to shoot in spite of the heavy breathing. It's tough for me to execute a hinge the way I want to when my when I'm breathing that hard. It's, it's similar to me to executing a hinge release while the wind is blowing really hard. The wind will be whipping and hitting you really hard, knocking you around. When that wind stops, you kind of have just a second or two to let that arrow go. It's hard with the hinge because with the hinge, I just let it float and it just goes when it goes. Sometimes it's, it, go, it goes sooner than other times, but I'm just focused on the holding. And it's hard for me to make the hinge go off because I got such clenched hands when uh, my fingers lock up, my hand locks up when that adrenaline comes. So with the thumb button for me, man, it's it's a godsend because I can lock on, the wind can be blowing me or my heart can be pounding and then I just stop, just recruit all of what I need, push, pull, push, pull, put that pin where it needs to be and the shot breaks. I always, while my pin is on the target, I always say, you know, Joel Turner said uh, to say, watch it to keep it. You know, that was a mantra that he told himself. Uh, I just say, hold, 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 hold in my head. And I just hold the pin there. And the shot sort of happens on its own nowadays. You know, whether it's a hinge or a button, it's like, hold, 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 hold. I'm not too worried about everything else. It's just aiming. And that's what the hinge taught me. When the hinge doesn't break and I keep pulling and keep pulling, and keep pulling, it's taught me to aim just to let that pin just kind of float around, accept that float because you're never going to make it be perfectly on. And if you try to time your shot with that, it's a recipe for target panic and other problems. But let me illustrate to you real quick, um, heavy breathing and then, and practicing, you know, shooting with your heart through your roof. So I'm going to drop down and do like 20 burpees and then shoot. And I think it's a great exercise to, to dive into if you haven't done it, you know, drop down, do 20 burpees. Your arms are jello, you know, do them as fast as you can. Your heart rate's as high as, it, you know, you're choking on air and then try to shoot in that moment and execute well. You might find out that, gosh, the way you shoot right now, you can't hit the side of a barn when you're like that. Well, just assume you're going to be like that when a big animal comes. You need to practice somewhat in that vein. Um, some guys don't get their heart rate like that, at least like me. Uh, some guys are way worse. So you got to know yourself. There you have it. <laughs> Usually... I would shoot three or four, you know, while the heart rate's up and see where I'm at. And that's kind of my, my test as well to see where I'm at, what range I'm comfortable with out in the woods. So I want to be real dialed at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 and know that I'm on. And when I'm grouping tight, everything's in a paper plate out to 90 yards at that point. What I want to do after that is I actually do a little of this kind of exercise. I might run up the hill, sprint back down, shoot, do a series of burpees, shoot. I'll get my heart rate really high and I'll see how accurate I am at 40, 50, 60, 70, 100. How much do my groups open up when I'm breathing really heavy mm -hmm. versus where do my groups go when I'm super calm? When an elk is out in the meadow, giant bull but he's feeding has no idea i'm there and i can take all the time in the world to take the shot uh in that situation most likely i'm gonna pull out the hinge i'm just gonna hold pull through my heart rate will be pretty calm because there's no nothing rushing the shot if a bull comes screaming in charging in on me I don't have a lot of time i gotta time it i gotta stop him as he's running through a window and then shoot my heart rate's going to be a lot higher because I don't have time to be calm, to breathe easy. It's quick. And then I got to make that shot. It helps me to know like when I'm at 80 
and my heart rate is just screaming and I'm still pulling off tight groups, I feel comfortable shooting longer ranges even when my heart rate's up. But if you find out that, man, beyond 45 or 50, when you're like that, you can't hit, then that's your range on the live animal, even though your range might be much, much greater uh, when your heart rate's fine. So you kind of have to just um, know yourself, practice a little bit that way. But let me grab these arrows. Ooh. This is... This is 55 yards right here. Um, okay. That includes the shot I took with my heart rate through the roof. I mean, all three of these were shot with the hinge release, and one of them was shot with the with the thumb button with the heart rate super high. So I'm going into this season feeling really comfortable with my setup. It's forgiving, feeling really good at longer range, even when my heart rate's super high. As you can see at 55 yards, I'm pretty much keeping my groups tight even when I'm like breathing really hard and uh, and switching releases even and punching it because that was a hold. If you watched, I'm breathing hard, breathing hard. I held my breath to stop my, and I punched in that window, that little one to two seconds I've got. Um, I just found that that, that works for me. And, and some people um, are always breathing easy and executing through that. Everybody's a little different. I've kind of figured out that I'm really lethal that way. So uh, I need to adjust it a little bit. Everything's a little high. Um, but I've, I've been shooting the bow for about two weeks, putting a lot of arrows through it every day. Strings are stretching. Everything's changing a little bit. I'll worry about getting it sighted in just right as they get closer. Uh, broadheads are hitting to the same spot as the field tips. So, you know, I used to obsess over tight groups, just obsess. And, it, you know, it's great. It's important to, to shoot consistency and to have tight groups. But over the years, I've been able to relax a little bit on that, trying to let that pin float and shoot my shot. And you know, if I'm in a plate at all those ranges, I just, let's say I have a flyer that goes here or one that goes on the edge, but it's still in the plate. I used to get all frustrated and get worked up over it and want to get those things tighter. Now I don't, I don't do that. If I'm in a paper plate, uh, group at every yardage, who gives a dang? That's, that's great. That's, that's all I need for killing an animal. So I'll see some guys come out and we'll shoot together. And at 40 yards, they've got a group about the size of a paper plate. They're frustrated. I'm like, I might have a group that, that, that big on one day. I'm not shooting well. Even on those days when I have those big groups at 40, I pretty much have the same groups at 80. I've just kind of learned like there's a certain amount of float I'm going to have in my shot, especially on days when I'm tired or I've lifted a lot of weights. Like the other day we did a million burpees and uh, tons of handstand pushups, tons of, uh, bar barbell, uh, bench press, um, or barbell presses, overhead presses, man, that push pull was killing me. Uh, it was hard for me to hold steady groups widen out. Even when they're, they're wide at 40, 30, 40 yards, they're still the same around, around 80. And I think it's just, there's a certain amount of float that I accept and because I just let the bow shoot and I let it roll, you know, I'm always kind of in the ballpark, especially on an animal. So it gives me a lot of confidence going into the season that, um, that I can shoot. Let's go back here and drop some bombs. All right. This is 81 yards right here. And like I said, I like to switch back and forth. There's a little bit of wind here. It's always harder for me to shoot a hinge in the wind, even though the bow's pretty heavy. You know, I've got the weights on the front and back, plus the uh, full quiver, some heavy arrows. Uh, it is a carbon fiber bow, the RX4 here, so it's a little bit, it is a little bit um, light in the bow, but heavier in the weights I've added. It's just what I found allows me to shoot accurately, especially at longer range, especially in heavy wind. Last year I was hunting some, for elk, I was hunting in some thick country. I ended up uh, balancing my bow uh, using 
the quiver mostly and no back bar, no stabilizer. And uh, all the shots were 40 yards and in, and I was super on. But at longer range, yeah, I felt like I needed um, more weight on the bow, more of a stabilizer setup. So let's drop some long bombs. Can't see at this range. Not quite dialed. It's still shooting a little high like everything is right now. It feels good though because, you know, with the hinge, I'm just holding, 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 and then just letting the shot break. Shot does its thing. You know, I've, over the years, when I use a, uh, a thumb button or a trigger of some kind, and I and I command it to go off, or I punch it. Um, there's there's a lot more uh, anxiety that can happen from that. So, like I said, I like to practice a lot with the hinge, and then just shoot. Uh, I'd shoot a few of my arrows every time with the thumb button. Um, and I kind of I kind of try to execute the thumb a little bit like a hinge where I just kind of put a little pressure on it as I pull and it goes off. I try not to just punch it, but I know it's going off where I don't with the hinge. Part of me wants to be able to do that though because on a live animal, that happens about 50% of the time uh, where I got to punch it. So I want to be able to stick it on there and send it as I want to. So like I said, I probably shoot eight arrows, eight out of 10 are with the hinge. Two out of ten are with the thumb button. Um, and that's pretty much my routine every day. I hope that kind of answers a bunch of questions. Uh, with the setup that I'm running right now, kind of how I shoot, I'm, I've been real happy with my groups out to about 9,500 yards. Uh, I've been shooting at that elk on the hill. Um, I like bouncing between these two releases, or at least a, a command release. These kind of anchor to the same spot. You know, shooting a hinge pretty much changed my life. Uh, being able to shoot a hinge and shoot it, uh, execute it um, accurately changed how, how I shoot. Joel Turner's Iron Mind shooting class I took with him, that also changed things dramatically. So using um, the techniques I learned from Joel, how they work, how they matter, uh, and uh, using a hinge really helps me be a very good shot. And then um, I like to hunt with a thumb button. Uh, I was just shooting at uh, 82 yards over here, kind of the end of the sidewalk at the elk, and the sun is just coming up. And where the sun hit over here, where it's been cool, this whole time sun hit wind just started whipping everywhere because those thermals are switching in the sun that heat just changed all the wind patterns and i'm over there trying to shoot a shot at that range after doing a ton of burpees and you know being tired now i'm starting to not be able to hold and i'm trying to hold 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 getting whipped by the wind i end up being at full draw a lot longer i can't seem to steady it there's a lot of variables in play and i'm pulling 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 and when the shot breaks it breaks and it, the pin isn't always where it needs to be i break out the thumb button instead i pull full draw wind is doing the same thing everything's the same wind breaks for a sec i stick it punch it and i group real tight so arms are jello tired all that and yet with the thumb button i can just make it go so i feel like you got to be able to do both, uh, especially for hunting. I think that that technique can develop some real bad habits for some guys. I see dudes all the time come out here with their, their index finger releases or their wrist rockets. They do a little bit of shaking and just at the same time as they punch. They don't, they don't have a, they have a lot of anxiety going into the shop bef just before they anticipate that shot going off and they, they grip the bow or they do something to to mess up their shot. And I see them just get so frustrated. I think if you start shooting a hinge, if you're having that, that kind of difficulty, uh, look up 
Joel Turner, Iron Mind Shooting. He has some great stuff that he shoots pistol training as well. You can find him on uh, YouTube training some of that as well. And um, it's the same concepts to shooting a pistol as it is to shooting a bow. And uh, but for me, I love switching back and forth. I feel like using this hinge <clears throat> release and just pulling through really helps me um, have a great, great shot discipline. And then when I break out the trigger, or the button here, I just use the same holding techniques, the same kind of shot. I just don't have that uh, anxiety. But I, like I said, I don't shoot tons of shots with this. You know, a couple rounds. I'll maybe do eight rounds with my hinge and a couple rounds with the thumb button. When the wind breaks out or anything else, <laughs> the reverse is true. If I try to shoot with a hinge in heavy winds, uh, or when I'm really fatigued, my my groups can get real sloppy, wide. I can miss targets. And that gets into your head. So that then when you're using the hinge, you're like, you have a complex with the hinge. So I like to, you know, when the conditions are right and calm and everything, I just crush with this. And then when uh, when the wind is whipping, I know I'm not going to, I'm just going to suck with this. That's when I switch to the thumb button. I'm so calm. I know I'm going to hit. I just wait for that wind. Boom. Stops. Push, pull. Hold, hold, hold. And the shot breaks. Wham. So, hope that helps. I hope uh, this was interesting for you. If you got more questions on my setup, just fire away. I like a lot of uh, hold weight on the bow. I like 80 pounds. doesn't bother me to pull. This Ultra doesn't seem... It's got a nice dry draw cycle and you can see me pull it. It's pretty smooth at 80. On my old bow, you can see I've got this Garmin Zero. Um, I've had a lot of people uh, make fun of it, mock it, hate on it. Uh, and I just say, um, I don't care. The thing is freaking awesome. <laughs> it's just awesome. And for those who don't know, um, the Zero basically at full draw, you know, I can range with it and it's got a little red dot. I put that dot on it. No different than my, than my range finder here. Same difference. I got a little red dot here. I'm look, putting on the target and getting ranges scanning. I got a little red dot here that's scanning. And as soon as I have it on the animal and I'm certain it's there, I release my finger off this button that's been uh, scanning just like my handheld range finder. Like I scan, take my finger off. Let's say it was 55 yards. It drops a pin that's exactly 55 yards because I have it calibrated for that. And I have single pin accuracy. Could be 57 yards. It could be 62 yards, whatever it is. At full draw, I just stick it on there. Gives me the pin, exact pin I need in a jiffy. Drops it into place. And then I execute my shot with single pin accuracy. It's really no different than if I were to range with my range finder and then slide my sight over here like I normally do with my black gold but it takes a lot longer right if I'm going to range this and it's 67 then I'm going to come over here dial to 67 I'm and in. then shoot you're losing precious seconds but more than that like on coos deer in Arizona I'll see a coos deer come and he's bouncing across they're so on the ball that the time it takes for me to range it and it's such a small target even at 45 yards I'm very reluctant to shoot without knowing the exact yardage because they come up to like just above my knee. I mean, they're tiny little animals. Being able to, before it even comes out of the, behind the cactus, I'm at full draw already. It's stays as still as possible. As he comes across, I'm scanning, scanning, scanning. Buck stops. He might look at me, might not, because they're just so keen. I got my exact pin. I shoot. Very minimal, very minimal movement on my behalf. If I were to do the same thing, Without a Garmin Zero, I'd have had to do this. I wouldn't have been at full draw yet. Then I'd have had to put my rangefinder down. Then I'd have had to draw or dial my my sight. Then draw. By then, that deer's gone. Especially coos deer. They're gone. So there are major advantages in terms of saving you time. The other issue, uh, I was on Kodiak. Big sick of buck, buck walks out. You know, you range it, you dial and you're like, okay, he's 47 yards, and then that buck jumps like diagonal away from you, 
a little bit up a hill and there's a little slope there. Two more steps and he's gone. Do I have time to let down and redial? And I'm, I'm on a single pin here. It's at 47. So it's like, well, what do you do? Well, with the Garmin, I can just range him again and get the exact pin and execute. With the black gold, I'm going to have to aim high and sort of guess that I'm within so many yards. Or I'm going to have to let down, range, and dial again. And odds are the opportunity on that shot is over. So there's no doubt that the zero saves you precious time. Um, some people are annoyed with it. They're like, it's cheating. I feel like if you use a, a handheld rangefinder and a, and a slider, uh, it's the same technology. You're taking the same shot. I don't see how that's cheating. You're saving yourself some precious seconds. That's it. The shot, it doesn't shoot for you. The, the zero doesn't automatically make you into Levi Morgan. You still have to do execute the shot you still have to make it under pressure you still have to make all the right moves and the right decisions but it does save you that extra movement and that extra time and if it's not for you it's not for you uh i would put it on my bow and run it on every hunt um just about for for our archery if it were legal now on the states i'm hunting elk it's not legal to use the zero so i've got the old timey uh fixed pin sight okay. yep and then um when I'm hunting in Arizona and Utah and in places like that, I'm going to run the, the Garmin Zero. So that's my take on that. I would say this, um, the, the one downside to the Zero, because uh, I've used it in freezing, wet, rainy, like all sorts of conditions, uh, it'll act just like, a, just like a fixed pin site. Just by tapping it, it'll go to a set of fixed pins. Um, it's got some other advantages because you, you can set up your pins per your arrow setup. So if I wanted to go with 400 grain or yeah, instead of 474 grain arrows, I wanted to go 425, get a little more speed out of it, uh, the arrows, or if I wanted to um, use uh, a, a finger release and so my impact points a little different, basically I could set up like 20 different arrow profiles. I can shoot different broadheads, different arrows, different releases, different combos. And I don't have to put on a new site or put a, a different sight tape on. I can just toggle through all my different um, arrow profiles on it. And it has a different aiming system for each one I choose to set up. That's pretty powerful. Um, it's really a modern sight for modern bows because there's nothing primitive about this high-tech uh, tool here. And so that's my take. The downside to the zero, in my opinion, is, of course, it's electronic, so it might fail on you at some point, just like anything, like your phone. iPhone can freeze, Android, whatever, your computer it locks up now and then. It's very, very rare that it happens, and that's a risk I'm willing to take for the benefits I get out of it. The other thing is, for longer-range shots, I don't like to use the zero. Uh, typically, I don't take shots over you know, 65, 70 yards. The zero is perfect for those kind of 65, 70 yard and in. When you start going beyond that, uh, the pin, those long range shots, they start dropping in the housing. You're really pushing. You got to have a pretty quick bow to get beyond 90 yards. So you kind of tap out. If you want to be shooting 100, 110, something like that, you really aren't going to do well for those long, long range shooting uh moments with the zero it's not really like that and frankly if you're taking shots that long you're in open country and that's what you're planning on doing zero is really not going to add that much value to you because yeah with that range i would think you have plenty of time to range and dial your sight it's not a uh quick in the moment shot for tree stand hunting for whitetail or blacktail or something holy i i wouldn't want to shoot anything else but the zero I mean, I shot Big Sexy with that. I never had to worry about, like, where he was coming from, when he would get there, how far that tree is, how far this is. If it's straight down, I got to shoot, or if it's up a hill from the stand, like, all these angle compensations. You know, I don't really have to worry about that. With the Zero, it takes care of everything. They're on high alert sometimes when they're coming through a stand setup. Maybe it's a water hole. Maybe it's a feeding area. You know, they are teed up, looking for any movement. It's so nice to just, oh, you see that buck coming, get the full draw, and you just move like a ninja. And then as it chase, maybe it's chasing a doe. That's another thing. And you just got 
you know, we've all been there when a rotten buck comes in, it's just going around and around and around up through the trees and the woods and behind you and back in front of you. And it's like the range is changing nonstop. Those bucks, dog and does, you only have a split second. They stop for just a second, look around, and then they go again. Well, with the zero, you got that. It's just like your range, range, it's like five yards, 10 yards, 30 yards, 20 yards, five yards, seven yards, 10 yards, 15 yards, 17 yards. And then he stops, got your pen, boom, and you shoot. It's awful hard to do, doing the math in your head and pin gap and all that. I love the the Zero. It's one of my favorite toys, one of the favorite pieces of equipment. Wish I could use it in other states, um, but it isn't legal in all, all the states, but... It is legal in two states I hunt a lot in. Right now I've got hunts in Utah and hunts in uh, Arizona, and it's legal in both those, and and uh, so I'm going to use it a lot over there. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Like I said, if you've got questions, fire away. Drop them in the YouTube comments uh, section of the video. Like this video. Share this video. All that stuff helps us. Use the coupon codes that are in the video. If you like the Valkyrie Archery uh, setup I've got right here. Uh, use the code gritty at Valkyrie Archery and you'll save 5% off uh, everything there. Like I said, I've got the 200 grains Jagger broadheads. I've got them running on these uh, Black Eagle X impact shafts and it's a it's a deadly, deadly setup. Um, the, the one thing that I, I want to be able to do really well is shoot in heavy wind. That's often when I'm the sneakiest not because of me, but because the wind is so loud that I can be I can be noisy on my stock and get right in the back pocket. I found that often, more times than not, my my bow, the best stocks I have are in heavy wind. That means uh, I want to be able to shoot in that. And with the thumb button that I've got, the heavy weight on the bow, which makes the bow more stable in a heavy wind, along with um, the Valkyrie system with the heavy front of center i really am able to shoot in the wind i don't have to hold off target in the past when i had a lighter arrow and i didn't have the foc in a heavy wind i was like well it's going to drift four or five inches right in this wind or six inches now i just aim on and i i just let that arrow go and it's funny you'll you'll see especially if you film which i do you'll see the back of the arrow blow in the wind and it'll actually kind of go fly crooked even but the tip stays on on uh target and i have yet to have that not just blow through an animal even though it's going going in at a, a slightly oblique angle as it hits um but it's devastating the way that you can just hold on target and shoot even in wicked wind i think part of that's because all that weight is up front like we talked earlier but I also think it's because these fletchings and this micro diameter shaft, it's not catching much wind. It's not. And you got that heavy tip pulling that arrow toward the target. So even though the wind buffets the back of the arrow a little bit and it, that tip just keeps pulling it on, it stays on course and uh, it's a wicked setup. So hunts are starting in a couple weeks and I uh, got two elk tags. Plan to drop two nice mature bulls this year. That's the plan. We'll see how it goes. Fingers are crossed. Stay gritty, folks.